You are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel KL. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. It's great to celebrate our God. We do that each week here. It's fun to have kind of a, a special emphasis of this, and, and uh, indeed, God has been so good. I've been here for five of the six years that this church has celebrated its Harvest KL, and uh, God has uh, so clearly led and directed us, and I believe He wants to continue to do that through His Word here today. And so I want us to uh, continue looking at John chapter 15 this morning. If you have your Bibles, uh, please open them to the book of John, the Gospel of John chapter 15, uh, whether it's a book or a phone, whatever it is, uh, let's look at uh, some of God's Word here this morning together. Uh, just, a, just a word of business here, we have been going through uh, the Gospel of Mark, and we will continue to do that starting next week. Um, last week, I began to introduce to you the theme of our year 2020 here at Harvest KL, and we're going to abide in Jesus, Lord willing, we're asking for that. And uh, really, uh, last week's message uh, is something that I wanted to put together with this week's message uh, because I believe that as we celebrate what God has done, we're also asking forward for what He will do, and it's uh, important for us to continue to put our eyes on this. And so, John, uh, I'm sorry, uh, John chapter 15 here this morning. Um, I would just say this too. Last week, I began to introduce to you the first eight verses of this chapter. This week, we're going to look at verses 9 to 15 in, in, uh, in Maine. Um, but in all of this, we're going to continue throughout the year to look at this chapter a number of different times. And that's because I, I believe that we need to meditate on Scripture. You can't just look at it once and remember everything that's there. Uh, many times you need to look at it over and over again to really see all that God is doing. And so um, we're going to continue to do this throughout the year as well and uh, just take bits and pieces. And, and by the end of the year, the whole thing hopefully will come together in our minds in that way. And so um, I, I want to begin this morning... Uh, by, looking, or by just telling you that last week as we were understanding that our role and responsibility is to abide in Jesus, that means to, to remain, it means to hold on to, to depend, I use the word cling. Uh, our, our role, really what we're trying to do th this year is cling to Jesus Christ in all of his ways. Um, as we do that, it, the text told us last week that fruit will be produced, and so if there, what we come to realize is if you're somebody who is abiding in Jesus, there is going to be spiritual fruit that occurs in your life. And, it, and so you can look at your life, and if you see that there isn't fruit that is being produced, and we remember the fruit is the fruit of godly character, that's what we're talking about. So if godly character isn't increasing in your life, it means you have a problem with connection to Jesus. You're not clinging to him the way that you should be. Because the text just tells us, this is the truth of God's word, when you cling to Jesus, gospel, char gospel character, godly character is produced in you. And one of the marks of godly character that is produced in us, when you think about the fruit of the Spirit, what is the very first thing mentioned as part of that fruit? It is love. You guys haven't been in Sunday school soon enough. You're supposed to shout that out. You, you know love is the first thing, right? Love, and, and I, I don't think it's insignificant that love is actually the first thing on that list. Um, and, and as we look at 1 Corinthians, we realize that you can have all sorts of other, do all sorts of great things for God, but if you don't have love, it means nothing. It's worthless. You realize the priority of love in all of these things. And, and today we're going to talk about the fruit of love that's produced when you cling, when you abide in Jesus Christ. And so with that, I want you to think about this. What is the greatest act of love that you have ever been given? What is the greatest act of love that you've received? Can you think of a way that somebody has loved you so well that it's like the gold medal of somebody loving you in your particular life? Maybe, maybe even think a little bit further. What is the gold medal standard of how you have loved somebody else as well? We're talking about love today, and I was thinking about the great love stories of, uh, of history and of the world, and I, and I actually think of one that is actually rather recent in, in our particular lives right now. It's in the form of a, of a sports announcer in the United States by the name of Ernie Johnson Jr. Now, if you know anything about sports, we, we call sports, uh, and the people that, that follow sports, we call them fans, Right? because they're fanatical, they're, they're wildly crazy and not rational about anything, and if you're with me, you're a fan of Liverpool, right? And that can kind of skew your life a little bit, 
Uh, that can be things that can cause you to do some rather crazy and wild things. And, and many times, I would call that misplaced love. We oftentimes talk about great love, and we think that it's like a sports fan who, who just is wildly infatuated with the team that he loves to follow, and, and yet it falls short in so many different ways. And so in the midst of this, in the midst of somebody who, who helps fanatics support their sports team, which I think is really kind of low on the scale of love in life, there's way better things. There's this man named Ernie Johnson Jr. who uh, has demonstrated great love. He and his wife have a number of children, but decided that they wanted to try to adopt a child. His wife Cheryl left for Romania in May of 1991, and she made her first visit to an orphanage in a village outside of Bucharest. On one of those rare occasions when they were able to secure a phone line, Cheryl, his wife, detailed the visit. As she waited in the lobby, a nurse brought out a child. It was a boy not quite three years old. He had been abandoned at the park shortly after birth. He could not walk. He could not talk. On the other end of the phone, my wife was having trouble speaking because she was in tears. She said, honey, I, I met this little boy today, the first child that I saw. The nurse told me, do not take, do not take boy. Boy is no good. Ernie, he has so many issues. He's so much more than we said that we could handle, but I don't know that if I can go the rest of my life wondering what happened to him. And her words hung there and demanded, demanding a response. For 10 seconds, neither of us speaking. Sometimes you're captured even on a scratchy telephone line halfway around the world, but not by the words you're hearing, but how they are spoken. Those words are coming from some inner recess of my wife's heart, some place not easily accessed, some place which only an abandoned, hopeless Romanian orphan had the key. Suddenly, all the things we had talked about and all the things that we had written in the required adoption paper about the severity of a child's condition we were willing to take became secondary. And I said, bring him home. Since that time, they have raised this child and to adulthood, he still has no ability to truly talk, and he cannot walk. He can't do the basic functions of life, and yet Ernie and his wife Cheryl daily love their little boy that they adopted and said, bring him home. He's mine. That's a great act of love. That's a gospel type of love. That's the type of love that is the fruit of holding on to Jesus Christ. And that's the kind of love that I'm challenging us to be and actively participate in in 2020 as we look ahead and ask, God, what do you have for us? What we're saying is, God, I want to hold on to you, but not just for my benefit. I recognize self-sacrifice and love for others is going to be part of this. Uh, I pray and desire that our church, Harvest KL, in 2020 becomes a place where we love like the Johnsons love their adopted little boy because that is an example of a Christ-like love. So this morning, I want us to follow a, a, a sentence that really is guiding what this passage is teaching us to do. And, and in doing so, I'm telling you the end before the beginning. <laughs> I, I want to tell you what we're called to, and then I want to explain to you the text and why it is before coming back and unpacking that ever, ever, even further. And so write this down here this morning. Our guiding statement is this. Abiding in Jesus means I'm in God's family, need God's family, and must serve God's family. Said another way, said the way the text is going to tell it to us, it uses just three words. It says, love one another. So let's read this here this morning, picking up from where we left off last week in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 9. It says this, as the Father has loved me, so I have I loved you. Abide in my love. Cling to it. Ten, if you, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that, your, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I, what I command you. 
No longer do I call you servants, for, servant, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. I want to talk a little bit about the principle, the basic principle, and I'm just going to tell you today, I feel so inadequate because I feel like I'm not even going to hardly touch the tip of the iceberg of what we need to say here today, but for time's sake, we're not going to do it all, okay? We'll come back, we'll meditate, we'll have other people preach on this and, and get fuller understanding of this command, but notice what the principle here is. The command to us is to love one another, right? So, so go ahead, say that. Love one another. Turn to the neighbor next to you and say, I'm supposed to love you. Now turn to the other neighbor and say, I'm supposed to love you. Now let's all say together, we're supposed to love each other. <laughs> Absolutely, that's what this text, it's, that's what I want to focus on today. The text has a number of things that it's saying, but let's focus on this here this morning. We are supposed to, number one, love others as Jesus has loved me. That's the way that we're supposed to love. Look at verse 12 again. It says, this is my commandment that you love one another. But it it doesn't just stop there. It, It goes on and tells us how we are supposed to love. It says, you're supposed to love one another as I have loved you. So the principle isn't just love one another. It's love others as Jesus has loved me. What it's teaching here is that abiding in Jesus produces love for other people the way he loves me. So think about that for a second. How has Jesus loved you? Most of you here today are followers of Jesus. Some of you are still trying to figure that out. You're trying to learn that. He loves you too. How has Jesus already demonstrated his love to you? Okay, stop, because we could just keep going on and on and on and on. That would take the rest of our time, right? But there's some pretty amazing ways that God has loved us. Look at verse 9. It says this, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. That's the way he's loved you. He's loved you the way the Father loves Jesus. Is there a greater love than the way the Father loves Jesus? There is not. There is not at all. So, So he says, As the Father's loved me, that's the way I've loved you. Abide in my love. Why would we let go? Why would we not be clinging to that? That's the way that Jesus has loved us. He's loved us like the Father has. Now, that's simple to say, but it's hard to truly understand. And so, let me use another portion of Scripture to maybe help us get our minds wrapped a little bit around that and how significant and how big that actually is. It comes from the book of Ephesians uh, in the midst of a prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 6, 17 it says uh, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We need to pray to understand how Jesus has actually loved us. You you just don't know that intuitively. You you don't even know that experientially. You, You only know that when you pray that, God, would you show me the largeness, the dimensions, the fullness of how you have actually loved me. Would that be a prayer that you would pray with us together this year? Would we be a church that would pray, God, would you show us the fullness of your love? Think of the amazing ways that God would actually answer that prayer for us. We we need to pray to see the fullness of it. And then maybe another verse that helps us understand this is in 1 John 3, verse 16. It says this, By this we know love. So this is how we're going to know it. This is how we're going to figure out what love is that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Fascinating here what happens. 
The definition of love, the way that we can know this great love of God is by focusing on how Jesus gave his life up for you and I. That is the greatest definition of how we have experienced love. And so in this, verse 9 of our text here this morning in John chapter 15, it tells us this is the way I've experienced the love from the Father and I'm going to share that love with you. Hold on to it, cling to it, look for it. Continue to focus and try to learn what that love actually is. So it tells us that we're supposed to abide in love. And verse 10 then tells us how to do that. It says this, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So so just a simple equation here. Uh, You can't say that you love Jesus and then disobey what He says. That's what this verse is saying. Those things are incompatible. That's not how that works. If you say, I love Jesus, I'm a follower of Jesus, Jesus is my Savior, then that automatically says, I'm submitting to the demands that he has on my life for obedience in all things. And what it is to have a battle to truly love Jesus and abide in it then, right? Right? to daily in the process of sanctification, that process of becoming more like Jesus, become more and more obedient to who he is. To know that there's, uh, uh, yesterday, I I thought I was in good standing, but I I read the word this morning, and now I realized I wasn't really even in a good place yesterday. I have to repent again, and I have to cling to Jesus again, and that's the Christian life. This life that says, I love the Lord And when I see that I'm out of line with him, instead of running away, I grab onto him, I abide in him, and in doing so, I I, I adapt my life to become obedient to him. More about that in coming weeks as well. But notice verse 11 then, it says, These things I have spoken to you that that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. The result of loving Jesus, abiding in his love, It's going to produce in you joy. Anybody need some more joy in their life? We we then have where it tells us to find that joy and receive that joy. Uh, These things I've spoken to you that you may be in, that they may be in you and that your, I'm sorry, spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. text goes on and it gives us this command in verse 12, to love one another as he's loved us. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. You're my friends if you do what I command. That linkage is coming together again. No longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. It's talking about intimacy. Let me just mark a couple of different things here because I want to get to the application, the ways that this actually influences us here this morning. Uh, The principle is this, that we're supposed to love others as Jesus has loved me. And that love is defined by Jesus himself. He is the definition of that love. That's what the text is telling us. Like, if you want to know what love really is, you have to do a study. And I would suggest a deep and thorough study of who Jesus is. That will teach you what, think about all the ways people lie to you about what love is in the world today. Think about all the false messages about love that that so many people believe. So you come along with the crowd, but eventually you realize that wasn't really love. So what is it? It can be a bit disheartening to follow the world's definitions of love. But here's what it is. Jesus defines what love is. Like if we do a study of who Jesus is, we will come back and understand love greater and greater every time we do. The second thing I want you to notice here is that love produces active obedience. That, that, it, that it's not like I, have to, I can fake things along for a while. If you really love Jesus, it produces obedience in you. That, that's the whole concept of holding on to the true vine of Jesus Christ. It produces fruit, the fruit of obedience, the fruit of godly character. If you're having problem obey, obeying Jesus, it's not try harder, do more, be more resolved. That's, that, that doesn't work. That doesn't change hearts. But Jesus does. Love produces obedience. And so our problem is oftentimes not the obedience itself, but it's the love and worship problem that we have behind it. I would also suggest to you that love is not an an act of duty, but it's motivated by delight. That this isn't something that you can just 
schedule yourself to have more love for, or organize yourself, or be more disciplined. It's not an act of duty. And so many times we fall into uh, the false idea that, that if I do things, God will be pleased with me. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is one that says, when you understand who I am, when, when you begin to have a relationship with who I am, when you, when you put your trust into me, I will change you, and I will make the difference that's in your life. So the relationship is so much more important than the religion that we say that we follow. You understand that, right? We've been on that journey. We've been learning that over the past year. And, and that's something that this needs to continue to help us understand as well. Uh, notice, too, that love is marked by sacrifice and ser service. Greater love has no one than this, that someone's sacrifice. Sacrifice and serve. remember one of the moments that my heart immediately grew in love. It's actually happened three times, each of the times my child has been born. And in and each of those times that my child was born, there's just like this poof, this new place of opportunity and, and, and ability to love. But, but I would just tell you this, it's, it's not a selfish love. It's not a, it's not a love that's about me. It's, it's like, I remember thinking after the first child, I don't know if we should ever have another child. I don't think I could love another child because I love this one so much. And then the second child was born and it was like, poof, I, I can love this child. And, and in that, it, not just feelings of love, not like I get to sit with a vanilla latte and have coffee with them when they grow up, love. It, but, but this love that says, I mean, think about what a child is in their first couple days and weeks. They just lay there. And they're not happy ever. And they only tell you when they're sad. And all they do is eat my food and then cause me to have to clean up after them. And then they sleep. It's not a selfish love at those moments, right? It, it, it's a self-sacrificing love. It's a service love. That's, that, that's maybe the best human, one of the best human examples of how Jesus is talking about the way that we're supposed to love one another. And in all of that, then, notice that he says, no longer do I call you servants, for servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I have made known to you. When somebody makes known all that they know, they're expressing intimacy with you. And what's being happened here is it's telling us that love pursues intimate, vulnerable friendships with Christ and his believers. So, so the principle here that we're supposed to love as Jesus has loved me, it, it's, def, it's modified, it's defined by all these characteristics that are, that are found right here in the text. And, and in that, I would just ask us, um, how can Harvest KL abide in Jesus' love in 2020? What are some ways that you, as a participant in this group project called Harvest KL, what are ways that you can abide in the love of Jesus. Really, as I think about the application for what this principle is, it, it forms the rest of the message. This is the principle right here. Now, now let's talk about the application of how do we do this? How do we actually abide together as the church of Jesus Christ, the way that he has put us together? How do we do that? What is, what is the instruction that Jesus is giving to us here? And I see three things that were really important to understand. It was the statement that I said at the very beginning. Let me say it again. Abiding in Jesus means I'm in God's family. Some of you are like, I don't want to be in God's family. I've seen God's family. I don't like what's in God's family. It's, it's tough to be in God's family. There's a bunch of sinners in God's family. It wasn't what I expected. I thought they were all going to be perfect because they had Jesus. And my idea of religion was once you have Jesus, you're all perfect. And, and I didn't realize the church is actually a hospital full of sick people that need help. Which is why I'm qualified to join <laughs> as a sick person who needs help. I'm in, in God's family. I need God's family. You're like, Pastor, I, if I were to be super honest with you, 
that's kind of insulting. I don't want to tell anybody I need anything. I'm a self-sufficient, strong man that doesn't need, right? You know, all that bravado and arrogance coming out of us. But we need God's family, and then we must serve God's family. Because love is active service. It's, it's not just warm feelings for one another. So let me just expound on those three things as, as we look at the rest of the message here today. It's this. Number one, application number one, when I cling to Jesus, he places me in his family. Did you know that? When you cling to Jesus, he puts you into his family, which the first response is, awesome, <laughs> get to be in the family of Jesus. Like that, That's got to be a pretty good gig. And it is. Right up to the point where you realize you have brothers and sisters. You guys have brothers and sisters in real life? Do you get along 100% of the time? Has that always gone well? Maybe it's even still painful at the moment, right? It's funny how we can know so, but somebody so well, our brothers and sisters, we grow up with them. We, we, yes, we start our own families, but we're always still family, and so we're still connected to them. And, and it's interesting how hard it is at times to love my brother and sister. And so while it seems like an awesome gig on the front end, we also have to recognize sometimes I really struggle with that. And that's why in this world today, there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I, I, I don't do the church thing. I don't really do the Christian thing. I just love Jesus. You understand that just loving Jesus means that you're in God's family. It's, it's incompatible. It's actually illogical. It doesn't make sense to what Jesus says to be the kind of person that goes, oh, I just love Jesus. I have a relationship with him. I just kind of try to avoid everybody else. That, that's actually not the way it works. That's act, you, don't, you don't get Jesus if that's the way you think. There is a, the, the vital connection to Jesus results in being in his family, in his church, in his body of believers. If you at one point were lost in your thinking and your ways and, and you came to your senses and the Holy Spirit convicted you and you realized, I need a Savior and, and Jesus is my Savior. When, when that happens, you're automatically adopted into the family of God, placed into a body of local believers, the church, and expected to be a part of that particular entity. So when it says... In verse 12, look at it again. This is my commandment that you love one another. You can't do love one another by yourself. It's as simple as that. And the theology behind being adopted as a son or daughter of the king is that you get placed into a family then. So let's say this together. Say it nice and loud. Let's sh shout it together. And, and listen, even if you have a hard time believing it, it's true. We're going to shout together, I'm in. Okay, one, two, three, I'm, you're in the family of Jesus by nature of putting your trust in Jesus Christ. Now listen, if, if, if you haven't believed Jesus to salvation, if he's not Lord of your life, if he's not your savior and your master and your king, then you're not part of his family yet. That is the dividing line. But, but it's right to say, I'm in if those things are true. And in, a, in all of this, what I'm trying to get you to just practically do here today is to acknowledge that you are in God's family. And that has some rights and it has some responsibilities. It's not like you just get to do whatever you want. If you're, if you're in the family, there, there's, some, there's some family obligation that's natural and normal and it's the way it's supposed to be. A number of preachers have, have talked about this concept and the idea that when you gather together for dinner tonight, if you were to go to the restaurant, the, the, the mamak, there would be somebody who would come up and they would ask you, what do you want to eat tonight? And you'd have a long list of things that you could get to choose from. And then they would bring the food for you and they would bring your drink to you and at the end they would clean it all up. You don't have to do dishes. But, but when you have a family dinner, is that the way it goes? Just a regular, normal family dinner, Okay. That's not the way it goes. You don't get to choose all the food that you're going to... It's not your personal preference at that moment. You get to eat what everybody else is eating. And then when, you, when, when you're sitting down together, there's, there, you, you, you have to serve yourself. You have to dish up your own plate. And, and then at the end of it, somebody has to clean up. 
And it better not be mom in anybody else is here, okay? Not just mom. Because it's family. Because family, there's, there's, it's right and good that there's, there's these res- rights and responsibilities that, that we actually participate in those things. And it's the same with the church. If you're in God's family, we have to recognize, we have to acknowledge, I'm in the family. I don't just get, it's not a restaurant that I just get to take, 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 and I'll give some money at the end and pay for it. It's I have to participate. I have to be involved in. I have, to, I have some obligations that are expected of me, and, and the same is true in the family of Jesus Christ as well. One of the things that I want to encourage us as a church to do is to become better at acknowledging the family dynamic which exist when you're in the family of Jesus Christ. One of the things that I'm calling, and, 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 and in calling and challenging you to this, by the way, I, I recognize there's been many who have already done this, but I would just say uh, it is time for you to join the formal membership of our church. If this is the place where you're being fed by God's word and you're being cared for and, and there's people who, who hold accountability to your life and, and who just are for you, if you gather together here on a regular basis and you just take, 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 and, you don't, and you're using this place, you're not utilizing it for what God has for you, then my call in your life is it's time to come to membership. Our next membership class is on Sunday, February 9. And there will be many who happened after that. It'll, the, the membership class takes place right after church. You come, you have lunch, you spend a couple hours, and we go through a process, you decide prayerfully. Listen, I'm not trying to make anybody become a member of our church. I'm saying decide prayerfully if this is what God wants. But would you actively come and be a part of these things? Because in doing so, you're acknowledging I am in God's family, and it's right and good that there are both rights and responsibilities, obligations that I would participate in in that process. When you cling to Jesus, he puts you in the family. Here's the second thing. The church is God's provision to cultivate his life in me. When when you're attached to the true vine of Jesus Christ, when when that clinging and holding on is happening and, and, and the sap of life of Jesus Christ is flowing into your heart and changing you and transforming you and giving you spiritual life, that, that, that is an amazing thing. But God wants you to know that he has provided the church to be the mechanism that will, will many times be part of how that life has happened. Now, I, I believe in personal prayer and personal devotion and personal worship. I believe we should have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but not also at the expense of having a corporate relationship with him as well. Because God's design is that he would use others who are abiding in him to grow me and to encourage me and to challenge me. This comes right from the assumption that is in verse 12. Notice it says, this is my commandment, that you love, love what? Love who? Go ahead, say it. One another. One another. The assumption in the text is that there is going to be an another that you're associated with, that you're together with, that you're bound to, that the means of God's grace to you is going to be others who love you. In all of that, don't just think selfishly about that. The reality is also others need you. So part of the reason that you're, you need to be in the church and that you, is, is that you have a need to be there. God's going to give his grace through others to you. But on the other side of things, it's going to be that others need you to let Jesus' grace flow through them into their lives as well. It's reciprocal as one and others are intended to be. And when you refuse to love one another, when you refuse to love one another, when you refuse to see your need for the connectivity of other believers around you, you rob yourself and you rob others of God's provision. So in our church, we express it in one way. It can be expressed in all sorts of different ways. But in our church, we express this in the numerous small groups and discipleship groups that we have that meet together. 
If you're coming to our church and you come on Sunday morning, we're so glad you're here and we think that it's valuable. We think coming together to worship our God, to just heat up the furnace of our love for Him through a worship service is an essential part of walking the Christian life, but it's not the only part. The reality is we need to be together more frequently than just for a couple hours on Sunday morning. We need the ability to connect more meaningfully and personally with people more than that. And so at our church, we call these small groups. And in this, I would just encourage you that if you're not currently part of a group that meets regularly together, whether it's the programmatic groups that we have or something unofficial happening offline, I really, quite honestly, I don't care what that is. I just want you to be doing what the text tells you is essential, and that is to be connected with other believers because they need you and you need them. So let's say together a different set thing. We said earlier, I'm in. Now let's say I need it. I need it. We need one another. Christ never intended you to live as an individual. He never intended you to live anonymously. He never intended for you just to show up and not reveal real heart level things that are going on in your life. He intended that to all happen within his family. And in this, I'm challenging you to embrace your need for community and the need of others for you to be in the community. I want you to embrace this. That means put your arms around it and and say, this is what is required and needed, and and I'm trying to go this way. I want you to commit to our church and, and, and commit to join a small group. You know, we commit to so many things in life which is often the problem when it comes to committing to the thing that is most essential for our spiritual lives. And so in that, I would just challenge you to evaluate, am am I committed to wrong things? Am I committed to too many things? Am I not committed to the right things? And in doing so, can I change some things in the beginning of 2020 so that by the end of 2020, the fruit of that occurs in my life? In all of that, I would just remind you that vulnerability and accountability are good for our souls and much needed. So I'm not just saying, on the outside, be involved in a small group, but never reveal yourself, never ask for accountability, never do the growing things that are required. I'm not saying that from an outward thing. I don't care the numbers and how many people. That's not why I'm encouraging you in these things. It's because our hearts need this. And this is the way we connect to the vine when we are vulnerable and accountable and loving and caring for each other in the body of Christ. Abiding in Christ means I'm in God's family. I need God's family. And then finally, I I must serve God's family. Let me just speak to this last thing before we end here this morning. Say it this way. Actively participate in the community, cause, and corporation of the church. When, when, When this text tells us that This is my commandment that you love one another. It's it's saying actively participate in the community, the cause, and the corporation of Harvest KL. This is where you're making your church home. And when it says that we are to love like Jesus loves, remember that Jesus' love wasn't one of romance. It wasn't one of feeling, uh, although those were, I believe, somewhat there as well. But really, it's demonstrated by action. Actually, Right at the beginning of the, all, uh, of the upper room discourse in John chapter 13, we have the record of that. Jesus gathers the disciples together in this upper room, and the, actually the very first things he says are, is in response to this shocking thing that he does when he gets down on his knees, uh, mostly naked, and takes a bowl and starts washing the disciples' feet. Peter's like, don't, well, don't do that. Nobody else spoke up. It was awkward. It was weird. The room got super silent. Jesus spoke. He said a couple different things. John 3, 15, or 13, 15 says this, For I have given you an example that you also should, should do, just as I have done to you. Talking about the washing of the feet. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Things are being said about himself there, but for sure, some things about us. Are you greater than Jesus? 
That's where my mind immediately goes. Am I greater than Jesus? No, I am not greater than Jesus. And so the way that he did things demands my response and my followership. And wait, he's serving the disciples. He's in this lowly position doing what the servant was supposed to do, but the, the, they forgot to hire. And so he's the one that's actually wiping the dirt because nobody else in the room was a servant. Think about that. All 12 of them should have jumped up and started washing Jesus' feet first if they really knew who he was. Do we really know? And do we serve like we know? In all of this, I'm just going to say that the statement that we all need to make together is, I will serve it. Can we say that together? I will serve it. I'll serve it because the model of the master shows me how he expects me to live and love, and it's through service. In all of this, I would suggest the people who have the best understanding of ownership of the family, meaning they understand the commitment of family, they understand the participation and their place in it, that, that the people who understand the ownership of what is requi required for the family to function are the ones that are best uh, used by God for his purposes, for his mission. So as kids, we don't really understand. The dishes need to be done. The floors need to be swept. The beds need to be made. We have to be taught those things. And in the family of God, I believe we have to be taught those things as well. Because there's this poisonous thought that is really prevalent in churches, and, and I think we have to be careful of it in our church as well. It's super easy to fall into, remember, Last week, my illustration, the, the down escalator, like if you do nothing, you just keep coming down in life. You, you have to work hard uh, at abiding to allow things to continue to grow and mature in our lives. And I believe this is a, a case of this as well. If we don't actively respond to this statement, we're going down. The statement is this. The poison is this. Somebody else will do it. Somebody else will do it. I, I know the church has some needs and but, but somebody else will do it. I, they don't really need me. I, I'm not really a, a big part of it. I'm, I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too uninvolved. I'm too busy with work. I'm, too, I'm only there some of the time. Somebody else will do it. It's a poison that will damage a church in a significant way when people stop taking ownership for the family dynamics of what, our, what God intends. And it's a warning to us to realize we need unlike the disciples who didn't own it, who, did, who forgot to hire the servant and then weren't able to stand up and wash other people's feet, that, that we not be like that, that we be like disciples who understand we have to serve one another. That's the way God intends for it to work. By your love, he, Jesus says, others who are outside of the faith, outside of a relationship with Jesus, it's by your love for one another that they're going to see something different and they're going to want to know what's going on with Jesus Christ. And so I just, in application, encourage you to actively serve the church. Actively serve the church you're a member of or that you're attending and a part of, the one that is taking care of your soul, the one that you come to and hear teaching and receive discipleship from. You need to actively serve that church. And for many of you here today, that church is Harvest KL. The reality is Harvest KL needs members who are committed to our church. They're committed to attend and be a part of our church. I'm not just saying like show up so that you get counted. I mean, with your whole heart, you get involved in the activities and the discipleship and the worship of God at our church. You need to be full-heartedly involved in those things. We don't just need attenders. We need givers of our time, talent, and treasure, all of it. We need people who give their time to the, the, the ministry and the mission of what we're doing, the cause of what we're about. We need people who, who give their treasure, their, 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 their resources of life. Yes, their money, it comes in many different fashions. And then serving with their talents as well. That's the way the body of Christ is intended to go together. We need people who are not just attenders and givers, but servers. People who see the lowly task and just do it. People who see the little things that nobody wants to do and are like, me, 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 I'll do that one. People who come early and stay late and, listen, I, in the balance of life, I'm not demanding your life from you, okay? In the balance of life, but do you have a heart of a servant that says, I'll do the lowly tasks. 
I'll do what's needed. You can just count on me whenever. And then finally, we need leaders. Our church has been on a journey last year. We, were, we put a lot of effort into cha- training a number of servant leaders in our church, people who are just in charge of ministry areas of our church. But the reality is, as we look into 2020 and ahead, we need people who are going to serve as spiritual leaders, as elders and deacons in our church. These are people who are growing in maturity and follow, f- fit the biblical description and ultimately people who are servants and givers and attenders and are members of our church and support those things. And my question is, are you one of those? Or do you know one that you would encourage and identify? Because our church needs leaders to continue in the mission that we've been given. In all of this, I'm saying that we are told the principle, the teaching is that we are to love like Jesus loved. And there's practical ways that as we celebrate all that God has done in the last six years, there's practical ways that this text is telling us and shaping what should look like in the next year and the years beyond. In this, would we be a church that learns to abide? Abide in the love of Jesus and actively participating in his family the way that he has called us to be and do. If so, then you will acknowledge and agree and commit to be in God's family. You will see the need of your own life and others for you to be in God's family and ultimately learn how to serve God's family in all the opportunities that he has given. In all of this, remember this final thing. This isn't something that you can do in your own strength or in your own power. This is something that Jesus has given us the model for. And so if you feel the dissonance, like, okay, I I understand what pastor's saying here today, but I'm not quite sure how to do that, look to Jesus. Learn how Jesus did it. Study Jesus. And follow the model that he has given. And in doing so, I believe that we will be the family that he wants us to be. Not the same at the end of 2020 as the beginning. And that's a good and right thing. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning and for the opportunity to study your word. We love you. We love your word. We want to become obedient to it as you have commanded. And so, God, we we trust you for that. We, We ask you this morning, would you help us to abide in your love? Would that abiding in our in your love be reflected in our obedience to you? And even to the command that's right in this text. Lord, would we be obedient as people who love one another? Would we love one another well? Would you teach us how to do that? Lord, that's our prayer in 2020, that as we abide in you, that you teach us what it is to live with one another in these ways. And so, Heavenly Father, we ask for your help in this today. Where we fall short, would you give grace? Would you help us to repent and trust you for new ways and then help us to live out each of those things in a new way as well? Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you for six years of your faithfulness to us. We celebrate that. We ask that you would continue to do this work in us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.